I mean, our sanctions policy is part of a broader U.S. policy with respect to Iran, and in particular Iran's nuclear program, where we have been offering the Iranian government the opportunity to negotiate uh, in a good faith, serious manner about its nuclear program on the one hand. But on the other hand, you know, so long as the Iranian government is not fulfilling its international obligations, is pursuing its nuclear program, we will use sanctions to increase the pressure on the government uh, so that the choice is very clear between engagement in addressing the international community's concerns with Iran's nuclear program on the one hand versus increased pressure on the other hand. So the sanctions are designed to put pressure on the government, not on the people of Iran. We have no quarrel with the people of Iran. And as a result, for many years, our sanctions have been designed in a way to exclude from the sanctions, so to permit trade in food, in medicine, and in medical devices. We do not have any sanctions on any company or any financial institution that engages in trade in food, medicine, or medical devices. What we focus on on our sanctions program in particular are those who are involved in helping the Iranian government develop its nuclear program, not on the trade in food and medicine. So the, the ultimate objective here is to try and, and slow down the development of Iran's program, its nuclear program, and to put pressure on those senior uh, officials in Iran who are responsible for making the policy judgments with respect to its nuclear program not to uh, make food and medicine uh, more expensive or scarce. So you speak about the exception to food and especially medicine, but the reality on the ground, what we see when we talk to people especially, is that there is a shortage of medicine, especially for some kind of special disease, such as cancer or MS, medicine for that kind of stuff. Why do you think there's a shortage? Well, I've seen those reports, um, and, you know, this is something that we are following closely, that we, that we care about. We're not looking, as I said, to, uh, to cause those, sh those sort of shortages. But I've also seen uh, reports that the health minister, Mrs. Dostgerity, was removed from her position recently because she highlighted the fact that the government of Iran was not funding the health ministry uh, in anywhere close to the amount of funding that had been promised uh, and so as a result, the health ministry wasn't able to purchase the pharmaceuticals uh, that the health ministry was looking to do, that the, the hard currency that they needed wasn't being allocated to the health ministry. Instead, the hard currency is being allocated by the government to other purposes, whether it's supporting the Assad regime, supporting terrorism, supporting the nuclear program. Those are choices that are being made by the government in Iran and that's having an impact, I think, on the, the ability of the health ministry to do what it needs to do to import pharmaceuticals into Iran. Uh, people see sort of a parallel of the mismanagement of the government, which you just mentioned an example of, and the pressure of sanctions, specifically the financial and banking sanction, the effect that it has on all kinds of trades with Iran. But um, the mismanagement part, the government's mismanagement, is not something that's new to the Iranian government, at least from the viewpoint of the people. They say the government has been there, has always had mismanagement, has had incompetencies from the eyes of the people. But the sanctions are what are new, and mm -hmm. since the sanctions um, came into effect, there has been specific reports of the shortage of medicine. So how do you think, as far as these two parallel um, our goal. Well, I, I think you're, you're right. The mismanagement of the economy is a long-standing problem in Iran, and I think responsible for you know, some significant portion of the, the weakness in the Iranian economy that we see today. Specifically with respect to, uh, to pharmaceuticals, I think it's been a long-standing problem, but the, the episode that I just described with the health ministry is a relatively recent example. Um, and you know, so I think this mismanagement, uh, you know, can build on itself and c can create greater problems uh, in Iran uh, that is sort of above what had been sort of the baseline level of mismanagement uh, 
that has been in place for many years. Uh, when we speak to attorneys who work with businesses, work with OFAC, are sp specialized in sanctions, um, in fact, I was speaking to somebody last night about this, and they were saying that although um, medicine, well, food doesn't seem to be much of a problem, food trade, even though medicine is an exception, the U.S. general sanction policy ha has been discouraging even third country actors, different parties that are part of the different steps of a trade, including paying, insuring, and shipping of all kinds of stuff to Iran, including medicine, even though medicine is an exception. They're saying everybody is discouraged from doing any kind of business with Iran. How is, is there any plan to sort of address that? Well, I think it's interesting, as you note, that there's not much of a problem with food. Um, and I think I've seen statistics that show that the food imports into Iran increased last year by, I think, 22 percent. It's the same international trade mechanisms for food as for medicine uh, and medical devices. It's the same ships. It's the same financial transactions. So, um, you know, I think there's obviously an ability uh, to continue to engage in trade in these types of commodities that are outside the scope of our sanctions. Um, you know, I, so I can't say precisely why there may be more difficulty with medicine than with food, other than I would again you know, point out that I think that much of the problem is the result of the government in Iran's choices that it's made. Um, but we have you know, made very clear to, to our exporters, to our financial institutions, and to exporters and financial institutions in Europe, in Asia, and elsewhere, that our sanctions do not reach trade in food and medicine and medical devices. We, you know, this, it's not a secret. We, uh, we uh, say that very openly, and we, we work with companies, we work with financial institutions when they have questions about the scope of our sanctions. Uh, we have put in place specific licenses and general licenses that will facilitate trade uh, in food and medicine and medical devices. So we have taken steps and will continue to take steps to make sure that the international community knows that these sorts of items are not subject to U.S. sanctions. Uh, so one part of the problem is in practicality what is happening as far as the trade. And there's also an image problem that there's this sort of whatever the obstacle is to the import of drugs and whatever is causing the shortage of medicine, part of the fault people see at the international sanctions pointing at the U.S. and at the West, and it's sort of hurting the image of the U.S. government in the country or in the region without compromising on policy. Mm -hmm. Is there any plan to address the image issue to avoid sort of a compromise on the image of the U.S.? Well, um, I'm not the, the responsible for image. I'm responsible for ensuring that our sanctions are, uh, are applied in an appropriate fashion. Um, you know, so what, what I can do and what I'll continue to do is ensure that as we focus very much on applying pressure on Iran's nuclear program uh, and doing what we can to make that choice between engagement and additional pressure as clear as possible, uh, at the same time, making sure that the, the world understands and that the Iranian people understand that our quarrel is not with the Iranian people. We're not trying to uh, focus on, on making food or medicine or medical devices expensive or hard to get in Iran. Uh, and we will uh, you know, continue to implement our sanctions in a very robust fashion, but that means you know, focusing on what we're sanctioning and not on what we're not sanctioning. Like you said, they call you the mastermind of the sanctions. So how far do you think the U.S. is planning to pursue this policy? And is there any concern that at some point it might have a reverse effect or become a tool for the Iranian government to use this as, a, as something to turn the people against the U.S. or the West even? Look, I don't know what the Iranian government will try to do, um, uh, but I know that our policy, uh, and the president has made this very clear, uh, is to offer Iran engagement, an opportunity 
to reclaim its position in the international community uh, so long as it's able to address these concerns that have been you know, cited in a series of UN Security Council resolutions, in resolutions by the Board of Governors of the IAEA, you know, very serious concerns about Iran's nuclear program. That offer of engagement uh, is out there, it remains out there, but at the same time, we are going to steadfastly continue to increase the pressure so that the Iranian government you know, comes to realize that it really has only one real option here, and that is to address the international community's concerns. So we'll continue to, uh, to implement this dual-track policy uh, and uh, you know, hope that the uh, Iranian government makes the right choice. And do you think it has had an effect, like you were saying, you're targeting, you're trying to do sort of a surgical procedure to pressure the government. Do you think it's had an effect on the government, what you're trying to target? Look, I'll leave it to the diplomats to, uh, to answer that question. I think that, you know, we are, um, you know, confident that the, that the policy we're pursuing is a, is a smart one and an effective one, and we're going to continue to pursue it.